But there's a lot that aren't, and we want to get their parents hooked up into here, right? Amen. Amen. Uh, yes, um, we did, Sister Pat, I apologize. I did want to pray special for you for the loss of your sister, Charlene. That's a hard thing to lose someone in your family. So we're going to pray for her that she's able to go and be taken care of and that everything's safe at home. Amen? Amen. Um, uh, also, update on Pastor. Pastor had his surgery on Thursday. Hallelujah. And he's, he's moving along. He's much better today. Um, the bleeding stopped yesterday. That's a victory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And um, he's going to be getting the uh, device out next Thursday, and then it will be no more. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. No more. And then he can really start getting his strength back. He wants to be here so bad. He told me just the other day, he says, I miss being in church. So we want to get him back here. Amen. Amen. And he wants to be here, too. So lift him up in prayer every day. The kidneys are coming back down to right size. And that's what we want. Hallelujah. So uh, that's that's an update on Pastor. Um, Sister Sharon, would you please pray over the service? And then we're going to have our brother Danny come and give us his word. Sister Teresa, you want to take the kids downstairs? Let's give them a hand as they go, please. We want the Lord's blessing on each and every one of them. We love them so much. And little Joey, he's a miracle. That, that baby right there is a miracle. He's not supposed to be alive. He's not supposed to be able to walk. He's not supposed to be able to talk. And I think he talks too much, right, right, Bobo? <laughs> she says just enough. Okay, and let's give Brother Danny a hand. Please welcome him. Thank you, Danny, so much for helping us at this time. You have a great pastor's wife, by the way. Not just because she gave me a nice introduction, but just because she is nice. Whoops. Well, praise the Lord. Anybody here happy to be in the house of the Lord today? Yeah, that was pretty enthusiastic. I, I, I just about believe that. Uh, before I get started, <laughs> I would uh, like my wife to come forth, if she would. That sounded really biblical, didn't it? Come forth, like Lazarus, come forth. Um, she has a little testimony about something the Lord's doing in our life that she would like to share. And because she's a colorful t storyteller, I'm going to let her tell this. I'm try I was hoping Linda would be in here. So she had to go somewhere, but I'm going to um, share it with you guys. And you guys are like the first people to know this. So you're special. My, my church hasn't even heard this yet. Can you imagine? All right. So how many of you remember... Um, I was here a couple weeks ago, and um, I said that the Lord had really spoken to me that some things that we'd prayed about, maybe 30 years even, that he was going to bring um, conclusion to those things, and we were going to reap some of the things that we've sown. How many of you remember that? Okay. God is so amazing. The very next day, the very next day, um, I was in uh, to tape my show. You all know that I have a show on the Holy Spirit Broadcasting Network. And um, the, the network is part of a conglomeration, affiliation of churches that go all around the world. There are churches from all around the world. And um, they came to, to us, really. But um, they came to us and said that they... <sighs> I don't even know how to say this, that they, um, 
were just so happy f with what God was doing in our lives and so on and so forth, and um, that they really saw us as a, having a global ministry, and um, they were thinking of taking um, us or me or whoever to some places like Africa and so on like that to minister. But the most incredible thing is, is that they said as they've been praying, I want to share this one thing with you. I put it up in the back. There's a Holy Spirit Summit. People are coming from all around the world. It's right there in Chino. And um, I didn't bring any tickets, but I do have them there if anybody's interested. Um, it's a two-day event um, at the beginning of November. But at the end of the, um, the summit, they're having a commissioning service where they're ordaining people and so on and so forth. And I'm trying to talk until Linda comes in here so she can hear. Okay. <laughs> so um, the very next day, they called me in the office and said that they had been praying. And they wanted to um, extend the, the name Apostle to me, Apostle Carol Dickey. And if you can believe this, I, I don't even know how to say it. They have um, decided to bestow upon Danny and myself honorary doctorate degrees for our body of work over the last 30 years. Was the day after I preached that sermon that things that we had been sowing and praying for for over 30 years, God was going to bring to restoration and to now. And the very next day they call in and says, Carol, we're giving you a doctorate. Now, if that's not God, I tried to talk about of it. I tried to say I, we're not worthy. We're all these things. They weren't having it. They told me they weren't taking no for an answer. And the Lord spoke so clearly to me and said, Carol, be quiet. <laughs> he says that to me quite a bit. Be quiet because promotion's from me. And you may not even deserve this, but I'm giving it to you as a gift. And I said, you know, Lord, I'm taking it. Amen. So I'm sorry, that, that was from the Lord. So at the end of the summit, they are, um, we had to get our robes with the little stripes and the little thing, the doctorate robes. So now when I marry somebody, I have a little doctorate robe. And the day after that, we go on our, um, our 35th wedding anniversary. Cruise. We go on a cruise and we can be doctor and doctor. <laughs> I'm hoping we can get better tables or something on the cruise ship if we just say we're doctor, doc, doctor, Seating doctor. Yeah. yeah, so anyway, but there's one other thing. Anyway, that, I just have to say that is a, that's the Lord. That is all the Lord. He gets all the honor and glory. And some other things have happened. I just, I'm amazed at God. But I did want to share something with you about Linda. The Lord spoke to me, Linda, about you when we were worshiping. And then I'm turning this over to Danny. Um, God is so good that this is what the Lord says about you, Linda. And I'm saying this, and I'm not doing it to embarrass you, but the Lord told me to do it publicly, so I'm going to do it publicly. The Lord said, you are a Proverbs 31 woman. And when I was praying for you this morning, um, I didn't know I was going to say this, but the Lord said, you know, he who finds a good wife finds a good thing. Your husband found a great wife. But really, the Lord gave him you. And Proverbs 31, it says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies, and the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil, and she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. And then it talks about all the things that she does that's just so wonderful. Like she's a businesswoman. She takes care of her family, the fruit of her hands. She plants things. She's girded with strength. Um, she does all of these wonderful, wonderful things. And it says her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land because he's known because of the things that you do as well as the things that he does. Strength and honor are your clothing, Linda, and you will rejoice in time to come. You open your mouth with wisdom, and in your tongue is the law of kindness. And you look well to the ways of your household, and you do not eat the bread of idleness. Boy, that's for sure. And your children arise up and call you blessed, and your husband also praiseth you. And many daughters have done virtuously, but you excel them all. 
And favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that fears the Lord shall be praised. And give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Linda, that is you. And that is a word from the Lord for you today because I heard it clearly and I know it in Jesus' name. So there you go. Amen. There you go. Well said. Very well said. Praise the Lord. I should have known better to give my wife the microphone, you know. I, I was tempted to just go sit down and say, mm, go ahead, hon, you got it. You can take care of it. No, I'm kidding with you. Actually, that wouldn't have been just fine. You would have probably preached this message as well as anyone. Well, today I'm going to talk about something somewhat familiar, but maybe a little different than what we're used to. Uh, I'm going to talk about the book of Malachi. And most of us, when we think of the book of Malachi, what do we think of? The tithing scriptures, right? How have we robbed God? We should tithe. Test God. He'll open up the windows of heaven. We all know those scriptures. We're familiar with them. Generally, those are something that come up at a time of offering or if the pastor is, is preaching about the topic of tithing. So I wanted to look at the book of Malachi a little differently. And instead of going to the third chapter, I want to go to the first chapter because that actually is the origin or the basis of why Malachi talked about what he did later. And that has to do with what I call the topic, is your worship worthy or worthless? And we want to look at the Jews of the time and Malachi's word to them from the Lord about their worship. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down these scriptures, Malachi 1 verses 1 through 14. And we're going to take a look at what the relationship was between the priests and the people and God. How were they treating worship? How were they worshiping? Were they doing it the way it should be? Was their heart in it? So, with that in mind, I'll take a look at the very first verse. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Isn't it interesting it's called a burden? It was weighing on Malachi so much that he had to tell the people, look, God is saying something to us. This is important. Pay attention. Interestingly enough, I, I have, remember when I first became a Christian that I have started going through the Bible, book by book, and I came to this book, and I thought, Malachi? I didn't know there was an Italian guy who wrote part of the Bible. Who knew? Later on, of course, I found out it was Malachi, and I was off a little on that one. But the message is important that Malachi had for us because he tells us how important worship is and how important the attitude of our heart is. And in fact, tithing, of course, comes into that later in the, in the whole proposition that Malachi gives us. In verse 1, it says, I have loved you, said the Lord, and yet you say, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau and laid his mountains and his heritage waste for the dragons of wilderness. Now, we think, oh, God hated someone? Well, when he says he hated Esau, what he really means is he's telling us that Esau's life, his lifestyle, his character was not pleasing to the Lord. Jacob was pleasing to the Lord. Jacob served the Lord. And that's how our worship should be. It should be honest. It should be holy. It should be pleasing to the Lord. In verse 3, or excuse me, in verse 4, Edom said, we're impoverished, but we'll return and build the desolate places. Now to set this up a little for you, this time in Israel is right after the 70 year time in Babylon where they were held captive. If you remember the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, you remember that the Babylonian king, after the Jews had been slaves or captives for 70 years in Babylon, the king suddenly changes his mind and his heart and says, I'm going to let you all go home, back to your homeland. You're all free now. And he even provided provision for them so they could travel back home. And of course, we know the story of Nehemiah and Ezra, how they rebuilt 
the city and rebuilt the walls and began to restore Jerusalem to what it once was. You'd think people like that would have been quite grateful. Imagine being, you know, your family, your, you've been in prison or have been slaves for years and years, and finally the slave owner or the master says, you know what, you can go free, and not only that, but I'm going to give you a bunch of things so you can go with you, so you can go home to your own country, to your own place, and rebuild. I'd be pretty happy at that point. Be like, thank God, we're finally free. We're finally back to where we're supposed to be. But the people of Israel were just maybe not as grateful as they should be. I'll give you an example, you know. You ever, you ever notice a little child, when you first give them a present or a toy, they're just into it like crazy, like, oh, wow, this is so neat, and they play with it all day. And but what happens over a period of time? Start to lose interest, don't they? Pretty soon it's like, that's not the coolest thing in the world. I don't really care so much about this anymore. And if they play with it at all, they just kind of half-heartedly play with it. And eventually it gets tossed aside into the toy box or the closet, and it's gone. It's done. We tend to treat things that way too, don't we? Think about if you've ever bought a new car. Now, the first few months you owned it, oh, my goodness, you polished everything on it. You shined it. You put air freshener in it. God forbid somebody scratched it. You had a heart attack. But, you know, fast forward three or four years later, it's dirty. It's greasy. The inside smells like wrappers of food, <laughs> you know, especially if you have children. And it's not so important anymore. It's become not the big great thing that it once was. That's what happened to the church. That's what happened to the Hebrews. The ritual of the temple had just become that, a ritual. Just a rote thing that they do. It wasn't important. It didn't have a heartfelt message to them anymore. It was just like, well, you know, today we gather and we do the sacrifice and we give to God and we sing a few songs and we go home. You know, it had become something just mundane to them. It, it had lost its significance. They had lost their heart for God. And God wasn't pleased by all this. Down in verse 6, the Lord speaks to them to try and touch them with the message. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I then am a father, where's my honor? And if I'm a master, where's my fear? Says the Lord of hosts, priests that despise my name. And they say, how have we despised your name? They don't even know they're offending God. They're, not, they're completely unawares. They think they're just going on with their day-to-day -day sacrifices and occurrences and everything's fine at the temple. The Lord says, you've offered polluted bread to my altar, and you have said the table of the Lord is contemptible. Polluted bread. That word bread there really means meat. It's the sacrificial flesh of the animals that they're offering. And I'll get to that more in a second. But then it says that the table of the Lord is contemptible. In other words, it's gotten to the point where the priests are not even happy to do what they're doing. It's just like they have to. You know, we got to go to church. We got to have our little ceremonies, our little rituals. And there's a lot of religions in the world like that that are caught up in that right now. People just do things out of ritual because that's what we do. We gather together and we light candles and we sing this song and we recite this verse and no one's heart is in it. Everybody is just there. Some churches today, and I, I hate to be so critical, but some churches today aren't houses of worship. They're really just social clubs. People get together. I don't know if you've ever watched anything on TV, you know, a big church or small church, where you're watching like the worship service. And you see people, they're holding a hymnal, and they're like this. Oh, bless the Lord. And they look like they're we're about ready to fall over asleep or they're so bored they could just you know pass out from boredom and I'm like your heart's not even in this 
And you know, the Lord, further on in this verse, in this chapter, says, why are you even bothering? He says, if you're going to come to my house and be like that, why don't you just close the doors and go home? That's basically what he tells them. And we'll see that. That the pollution is the contemptibility that they've taken because they're not taking it as seriously to heart as they should. It's like, oh, we just have to do this, so we'll do it. We have to look at our hearts and say, am I worshiping God in spirit and in truth like Jesus told me to? Or am I just doing this because everyone else around me does it and that's what I've been brought up to do and that's what I feel guilty if I don't do, so I'll do it. There's two points of view. Verse 8 says, you offer the blind for sacrifice, and that's evil. You offer the lame and the sick, and that's evil. Offer it to your governor. Will he be pleased with ye or accept you, says the Lord? Now, this refers back to the book of Deuteronomy where, if you recall, there were very specific instructions given to them about sacrifices. You brought the best animal, the cleanest one, the one without spot. You certainly would never bring a sick lamb or a sick goat or a sick dove or one that was lame or had, you know, a disease or whatever. You would bring the best. God said, bring me the best animal in your flock for a sacrifice. Don't bring me the junk. You know, if Jesus comes to my house for dinner and I've got filet mignon and lobster in the refrigerator, it would be really poor of me to give him the three-day-old hamburger helper. That ain't cool. Let's be honest. No, we give Jesus the best. He's here to have dinner. I'm going to give the king the best. I mean, and the Lord even points it out as far as the governor. He says, you wouldn't give that to the governor. You wouldn't give that to a, a, another person who's important, a mayor, a governor, a, your boss. If, you come to house, if your boss comes to the house for dinner, are you going to give him that? No. You're gonna, you want him to have something good. So, so, so the Lord says, how come when I come for my sacrifice to my temple, you give me junk? Oh, the Lord's not happy. And he's being a little sarcastic with them, in fact. Down in verse 9, it says, oh, excuse me. <clears throat> he says, I pray that you beseech God that he will be gracious unto you. This has been by your means. Will he regard your person? Now, that wording there is a little hard to grasp, but what God is saying is, you bring me the worst things you have, and then you expect me to listen to you and grant you grace and good things. Really? The Lord is being sarcastic. He's like, how come you bring me the worst, but yet from me you expect the best? I give you my best. Why don't you do the same for me? So in verse 10, who is there among you, even who would shut the doors for nothing? Neither do you put fire on my altar for nothing. I have no pleasure in you, neither will I accept an offering at your hand. This is what I referred to earlier when I said God basically is telling them at this point, look, if your heart's not in this, if your attitude is this way towards me, shut the doors of the temple. Forget the whole thing, go home. Because I don't want your poor sacrifices. I won't accept them. God has told them directly, this is unacceptable to me. Your heart is not right with me. Your sacrifice is not pure before me. I don't want it. That's a terrible thing to be thought, told by the Lord that I don't want what you're offering. Because he knows their hearts and he says, you know what? You're not offering me something that's good. You're not offering me your best. You're offering me something just because you think you have to or because it's the tradition or the ritual to do so. And I don't want that. God's not interested in our traditions. How many know that Jesus said, your traditions make void the word of God? We always do it that way. I used to have a pastor that said the seven worst words in church are, we never did it that way before. That's so true. It's like, like God can't decide to come up with something new. The one who created a universe can't one day decide, I think this way would be nice for a change. No, it's like we have to do it this way 
because that's the ritual that we perform every time we get together. And God says, I don't care about your rituals. I want your heart. From the rising of the sun until the going down of the same, my name shall be great among the Gentiles. Thus Malachi is giving a prophecy there about the future church. Because even though this group of people wasn't worshiping God truthfully and worthily, God is telling them one day there will be people. One day they will be people who worship me correctly in spirit and in truth. And here we are. That's <laughs> right. Thank you. <laughs> and in every place, incense shall be offered unto my name. Anybody know what incense is in the Bible? Prayer. Anytime you see incense mentioned in the Old Testament or in the book of Revelation, it's prayer being offered up to God because the sweet smell goes up to him and he describes prayer and worship as a sweet smell unto God. So incense is significant because it describes pure worship being offered to him. It's a sweet smell in God's nose. In every place, incense will be offered. Well, there isn't almost nowhere in the world where prayer isn't being offered. This morning, as we go around the world, hour by hour, there's church services probably in every time zone. Somewhere. My name shall be great among the heathen, says the Lord of hosts. Well, we were all once heathen, weren't we? <laughs> so now we're no longer Gentiles or heathens, but we're adopted sons and daughters. Because God said, your worship, your heart is acceptable. I want your sacrifice of praise. We don't sacrifice animals anymore. Jesus paid it all. We don't need to. But we sacrifice praise. We give our offering to the Lord through our voice, through our heart, through our tithes, through our offerings of our time and our efforts and our prayers. But we still give to God our best. And that's what God hears and that's what God sees and he honors that. The priests say, you have profaned it. The table of the Lord is polluted, and the fruit thereof is contemptible. They just didn't get it. They didn't understand that it wasn't just a matter of following the rules and doing the right things. Step A, we kill the animal. Step B, we put it on the fire. Step C, that wasn't what it was all about. Yeah, those were things that had to be done, but it wasn't that order and that structure that God was looking for. I mean, after all, think about it for a moment. If God was a man and he needed to eat, couldn't he just create anything he wanted to eat? No, he doesn't need those sacrifices of animals. In fact, if you read into the Old Testament, you'll see that when the animals were sacrificed afterwards, it was given to the priests. That was their food. God himself did not come from heaven and eat it. He could have, but he didn't need to, and he didn't want to. That wasn't the point. And these priests didn't understand that that wasn't the issue. God didn't have to have this. He wanted it as a matter of establishing a relationship with his people and showing the covenant that he was making with them. And they missed that point. These people should have been happy as all get out to come back from captivity and to be, I would have been at that temple every day praising God for getting me free out of Babylon. They were locked in a prison for a long, long time, probably forbidden to worship God, you know, not allowed to be free on the streets. And here they are back in their home country. These folks ought to be real happy. But instead, they're just like, oh, I guess we've got to go to church. Yeah, I've got to do the, the service. Oh, yeah, especially the priests had the worst attitude of all. Kind of reminds me of this couple I heard about. This couple woke up on a Sunday morning, ready to go to church like they always do, and the husband turns to the wife and he goes, you know what, hon, I'm sick and tired of going to church. I could just go play golf today. I've had enough of this church. And she goes, why is that, hon? He goes, well, you know, we sing the same old songs every week. We hear the same old message. There's nothing new, nothing different. I'm just bored with it. 
And she goes, well, honey, you have to go to church. And he says, give me one good reason. And he looks at her and says, why? Why should I go to church? And she looks at him and says, because you're the pastor. <laughs> that poor pastor obviously had fallen into the trap of ritualism. He's just doing it because it's my job. I go to church. The choir sings. I speak a message. Everybody shakes hands and goes home. And nobody's changed. And nobody's heart gets softened. And nobody's life is touched. Because they're not open to the moving of the Spirit of God. And that's what we need to be most of anything. When we come to worship, worship is an act of communication. It's communion with God. It's walking into the throne room of God boldly, as Scripture tells us, and saying, Lord, I'm really glad to be here because you are awesome. That's the bottom line of it. And Lord, I want you to do in me whatever it is you desire because you are great. Not I'm here, Lord, because they told me I had to be. You know. Verse 13 says, it's what a weariness it is. You people actually were tired out by going to the service and going to the temple. It's like, oh, I know, we have to. You know, it's like your kids when they're little. You know, you ever had children who didn't want to go to church, and especially if they're in that little four, five, six-year-old, I don't want to. I want to stay home and watch cartoons. And you have to instruct them that we go to church for a good reason, and not because we, that's just what we do, but because the Lord is there and we're there to be with him. And so these, these priests were actually like whining and complaining. It says, you have snuffed at it. That's an interesting term I thought of because you ever seen somebody who's kind of like disgusted with something and they, they kind of make a thing like this, like, huh. In fact, one of our dogs does that. When she doesn't do what, when, when she does something she's not supposed to and she gets corrected, she'll go lay in the corner and she'll actually make this remark at you like, huh. And I swear, this, this little dog has personality to like tell you, well, that's what I think of you. And that's what these priests were actually doing that to the, to the service and to the Lord, saying, uh, we're just here because we have to. Just do it. Come on, let's get it over with. And you have brought that which was torn and lame and sick. Thus you brought this as an offering. God says, I look at what you bring to me. And then he says, should I accept this? And the answer obviously is no. That's not your best. That's not what I asked you for. I asked you for your best. I wanted your heart, and you gave me your body. Like the scripture says, your lips are praising me, but your hearts are far from me. Yeah, you come in here, and you make the right words, and you do the right gestures, but I want this. I want you. I'd rather you didn't bring me a sacrifice, but you brought me yourself. Because obedience is better than sacrifice. And I'd rather you came in here and were obedient to me and we had fellowship with one another than they bring me a sacrifice. Cursed is the deceiver. The deceiver is someone who tries to put it over on others. Sometimes people would try to bring something in and like make themselves look big. You know, the person who... Uh, wants to tell everyone how much they gave to the church last year. It's like, here's a thought for you, my friend. I don't care. He cares. I don't. It was two cents or two million. That's none of my business, and I don't care. You know, as long as it came from your heart, that's what's important, not what came from your wallet. Who had said his flock of male and vows and sacrifice unto the Lord, a corrupt thing. Never give God corrupt things. He's holy. He doesn't deserve them. He's worthy of good things to be offered to him. The Lord says, I'm a great king, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. I'm impressive. I'm a big God, and I'm a holy God. Don't bring me your trash. I don't need it. I want you. I want the best. And, you know, as we go on about this, we can see that 
there's something there to be said to us from the Holy Spirit that is our worship worthy of God? Are we giving him us? Because the, the ultimate thing he wants is us. Our being, our existence, our spirit, our hearts. All the other stuff is good, and it does require those things that we give of our time and our money and all these things and our efforts. But ultimately, it's us that he wants. That's what we were created for, to have communion with God. You know, he could have created all those things if he just wanted things. That's not what he wanted. I want to take one final look at something. If we go down to uh, verse 14, where he says, Who has in his flock a male and vows and sacrifices to the Lord a corrupt thing? I am a great king. That tells us all we need to know right there. God is a great king. And you wouldn't give a great king come into your house the worst thing you had. Would you make him sit in a cheap chair that is broken? No, you give him your best chair. You give him your best dinner. You give him your best of everything you had. You'd ask him, are you comfortable? Is there anything I can do for you? If you do that for each other, for your guests, for your friends and family, how much more is the Lord deserving of the, our best? When he comes, or better yet, when we come to his house, how do we treat him? You know, he's invited us to come. And here we are in his house. And how do we act towards the one who gracefully blessed us with an invitation to come and provided everything we need? You know, too many people today think they can just sit through a church service and somehow they've participated in worship. Were you in church? Well, yeah, I was there. Didn't do anything. Sat in a corner and, you know, played with my telephone. Let's see. I got any games? Oh, there's solitary. I think, uh, oh, a pastor, what's he talking about? I don't know. <laughs> if you ask them after the service, what was the message about? Um, I'm not sure. Something about Matthew? No? I don't remember. Oh, no, it was that Italian guy, Malachi. That's what it was. I remember now. So, now I want Italian food for dinner. Anyway, uh, that isn't true just because you went to church. You know the old expression, don't you? Just because you're in a garage doesn't make you a car. It's a cliche. It's been said a million times, but it's true. That's right. Unless your engine's running for Jesus and you're in the garage and you're creating a little smoke and heat and power like a car does, then you're a car. I want to be a car. I don't want to just be sitting in the garage. You know, I got all kinds of stuff in the garage. Most of it's useless, you know. I want to be a car that's running. I want to be a car that's powerful, that's fueled with the right fuel which is the word of God. I want to be fueled by the Holy Spirit, who's the pilot of my car. You know, they say, God is my co-pilot. No, I want him to be the pilot. I'll sit over in the seat and watch him drive because he knows where to go and I don't. And to paraphrase an old movie, I don't need no stinking GPS. I got the Lord. He will tell me where to go. You all know why Moses and... and uh, the Hebrews had to wander in the desert 40 years, don't you? Because Moses wouldn't stop and ask for direction. <laughs> Typical guy. Anyway, just to, to end this all, <laughs> somebody said amen. Uh, we must be certain that our worship is righteous before the Lord. Is my heart right? Is the reason I'm saying and doing what I'm doing motivated by a love of God? and by a desire to be pleasing to him. If it is, we're right. If it's not, that's easily correctable. We can come to the Lord any time and say, Lord, forgive me. I'm not taking this the way I should. I'm not acting the way I should. I want this to be real, Lord. Make this real in my heart. Make this feeling in me a real feeling by the Holy Spirit. Let him work in me. Let him build me up. Let me understand what worship of you really amounts to. 
and what it should be and what it can be. The poor Israelites, they don't know what they missed out on because all throughout the Old Testament and even today, whenever God is truly worshipped, he moves in his people and he does amazing things. But he says, your heart has to be right for me if you want me to intervene in your lives and to touch and to do and to move. And if anybody here wants that, I know I do, then our worship has to be offered up pure. And the Holy Spirit can bless that worship and say, yes, I'm working in you. I'm changing you. I'm moving in your life. And that's what we want. That's what we desire. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Let's pray. The Lord show us those things. Father, we ask for a blessing, Lord, but by your Holy Spirit, that you touch the minds and hearts of every individual here. Show us, O oh God, how to be true worshipers, to lift up the name of Jesus, Father, in spirit and in truth, as you have so taught us. Lord, let those words ring true in us. Let us know today, O oh God, that we would not be like the children in Malachi's time, the priests who just did it because it had to be done. But let us bring to you a spirit of praise, of worship. Let us have communion with our Father who has adopted us as children into his family. And let us truly love you, Lord, with the spirit of love, with our adoptive hearts open and ready to receive from you, to give everything we have of you, Lord, as you gave everything to us. For we know that you loved us so much, you gave the best thing you had. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for all that you give to us. For you are a good God, a mighty God. You are the God who provides. Jehovah Jireh, we know that you give everything you have to those you love. In Jesus' name today, Lord, bless us. Bless us for hearing your word. Let your word settle in us and be a part of us, Lord, in your precious name. Amen.